Hello, I'm Alistair McLeod, and I'm here in Madrid on behalf of the Gold Money Foundation, and with me is Philip Bagus, who is the author of this interesting book, The Tragedy of the Euro, a very topical subject, Philip. Um, I was particularly interested in, uh, you were using the analogy of the tragedy of the commons, which um, I think very briefly, if I can describe it correctly, is when everybody uses a common facility without regard for its future. And you've interestingly used this as a description as to what some of the countries within the Euro region have been doing since they joined. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes. Um, the tragedy of the commons occurs when property rights are not defined well. Uh, an example would be fishes in the ocean. No one is the owner, so everyone can, can fish. So the incentive is to fish as fast as you can because otherwise the other fishers will, will fish and have the profits. While stocks last. <laughs> yeah, yes. so, so it leads to over-exploitation. And the same happens with, with the euro. What is exploited there is the purchasing power of the euro because in a complex way any government can basically print, print euros. Well, I, let me explain this. What governments can do, they cannot print euros, but they can print paper and they write on it government bonds. Then they sell it to the banking system, and the banking system gives it to the ECB as collateral for new loans, and the banks receive new reserves, and on top of these reserves they can expand the money supply, credit expansion. So this is the way that uh, traditionally um, government deficits are indirectly monetized. The same happens with the Fed. The only difference is that the Fed buys directly the government bonds. It doesn't take it as collateral for new loans. But at the end, it's the same. Where well, the thing in the Eurozone is that not one government can do that. That is, finance the expenditures through monetization, uh, through the banking system, but any government can do that. So the incentive is to, do, uh, to externalize the costs of your deficits on the use of the currency, but in this case, the users of the currency are not only your citizens, but also the citizens in the rest of the Eurozone. And there's one more point. Um, in analogy to the fishing example, let's, exa uh, let's imagine that Germany has a deficit of 3% of GDP and it prints government bonds, it's financed, so the money supply increases, prices rise. And the rest of the Eurozone has a deficit of 10% of GDP. And then let's say this also financed and prices rise in average in the Eurozone 8%. So the, then the German government, even though it has a deficit, the real government, German government spending may actually fall. So you can only profit on cost of our other governments and other people if you have a higher deficit than the rest. So the whole thing works as an incentive to run a higher and higher deficit, essentially. The other thing that's interesting about this is that one forgets history very much. Um, and you reminded us in this book that some of the countries that joined the Eurozone actually was their short-term salvation because they were already um, running very, very poor finances. The deficits were too large to sustain and if they didn't join in, they might have suffered a rather nasty inflationary fate. And I thought that was a in very interesting point. Um, so that really they've morphed from that into um, a credit bubble, essentially, which, as you describe it, they had a great incentive to get that credit before anybody else got it, essentially. Yes. So um, how do you, I mean, how, how does one deal with this tragedy of the commons? Is there a, is there a, a, a solution for it? Well, they knew the incentives. Uh, from the start, they didn't describe it as a tragedy of the commons, as, as, as I do. But they wanted to put, they knew the incentives for this, so they wanted to put a limit on the deficits. Like there's a stability and growth pact, 3% of GDP is the same as they do for uh, fishers in the ocean. You put quotas. So every fisher, you have a quota, so many tons of fish you can fish. So they said you, you can exploit the currency euro and having a deficit until up to 3%. But the problem was that no one is enforcing that. No one is imposing penalties if you, if you fish more than you should, if you have higher deficits. Why? Because 
governments are judging on themselves. They are their own judges, so they decide, okay, no, in this case we won't impose <laughs> penalties. And in fact, there have been, I, I think, more than 80 infrictions, infringements on the limits of the stability and growth pact, and no one uh, penalty has ever been enforced. So the, it was a total uh, failure, is the stability and growth pact. Because there were two aspects of it, weren't there? There was the current spending and also there was the accumulation of government debt. Um, I think, um, under was it the Maastricht Treaty that set this up, that, um, that no country could go more than, was it 60%? 60%, yes. Of GDP, and of course, I mean, they're all over that now, aren't they? Mm. Pretty well, except the new entrants, perhaps. Perhaps, yeah. Well, last year, on, only two countries had a deficit lower than 3%, that was Finland and Luxembourg. Yeah. yeah. And the average of the Eurozone debt per GDP is, was, I think, 80% or 88%. So, and if 60 is the limit, you see that uh, it did not really work. And even Germany is over it. Um, Germany is also over it. Nearly 80%, aren't they? Or 78% or something? Yeah, I think it's 78% and they also infringed several times the 3% deficit. Yeah. So the tragedy of the commons is um, intact. Yeah. Is, is a very interesting. I think it's a very interesting analogy, and it cert certainly caught my eye. My eye. Um, anyway, that you wrote this book. It was published last year, I think. Um, and since then, events have moved on. Have you been surprised at the way the events have developed in any way, or did you s sort of think that? It's actually quite a natural progression, given the level of debt, the reluctance to cut spending, and so on and so forth. Yeah, it's uh, well. There has been a second edition in June, so I, I updated it a little bit. But yeah, <laughs> if you read the book, uh, you you won't, you aren't surprised at what happened. No, no, you are not surprised because you know the incentives, what the incentives of politicians, the history behind it. Uh, so it doesn't come for a surprise, with a big surprise what is, what is happening. One thing that uh, I think is, is, is behind this, which um, I don't think any of the politicians really foresaw, was that the knock-on effect of the financial crisis of 2007-2008 was that it accelerated the deficits in all governments around the world and there just haven't been enough savings to meet government borrowing requirements in aggregate. Um, there some countries have been able to print their way out of problems, uh, such as America and the United Kingdom, but the ones that haven't been able to do it are these weak Euro states. Um, how is that going to be resolved, do you think? Is there any resolution, or have they just got to cut their public spending very, very hard and get that back, firstly into balance, and then into a position where it can definitely be financed. Is there any other alternative? Yeah, th this is the first... Uh, uh, I give in the book three scenarios for the future. This is the first one, that governments actually reduce the deficits, privatize uh, public assets, reduce the deficits, um, reduce government spending. And they, for some part, they do it. They go in, the right, in this direction. But it doesn't look that it's is enough or can be enough because the resistance uh, um, by the population that get, get rid of its privileges that were financed through this redistribution of the tragedy of the commons is, is, is really high. So we see that uh, in Greece there are problems, uh, in, in Italy, um, in Spain we will see the market is already discounting that there will be harsh reforms after, after the elections uh, next uh, Saturday, uh, Saturday or Sunday. Um, so we will see if then there will be strong resistance in the population by labor unions, and if, if there can be uh, measures drastic, drastic enough to reduce the deficits. And as you said, the deficits were already high before the financial crisis, uh, especially uh, because we have this effect of the welfare state that were already unsustainable from the beginning, and we have this uh, population that gets ever older, and we have this un uh, um, unaccounted liabilities in the future. So we were on the way to, uh, to collapse, but the financial crisis, of course... Uh, it sort of brought it forward, in a brought sense. Brought it forward it? Uh, yeah. very much. No. We have also to consider, consider that during the bubble, in the years before, there were huge government, uh, increase in government uh, revenues. 
Uh, for example, in, in Spain, they increased government spending almost as fast as, as the revenues. Uh, and this all break away suddenly. So now they have the problem to, to adjust this. So this is the first scenario where the second is it's the euro disintegrates because, for example, Germany says, no, we don't want to support uh, all, the, all the parties in, in the Mediterranean countries anymore. Um, sustain the standard of living there, so we, we get out. Or there's a revolution in Greece and Greece leaves the euro. It's also possible. Then the euro disintegrates, and the third po possibility to solve the problem is yeah, to print the way out of it, as you said, like, like the US or UK did. And then we might have yeah, inflation, yeah, high inflation. Mm. There is a, um, a, a huge institutional resistance to uh, breaking up the euro. And I can see that the Eurocrats, if I can call them that, um, you know, they feel that uh, if such a thing were to happen, it would be, um, if you like, the end of the experiment, the Euro experiment, it would be politically devastating. It would mean the whole of the European project potentially would start sort of going backwards on itself with all the social consequences, whatever they may be. Um, it's central to this really is Germany and the thing that, 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 that I find interesting is that uh, Germany is a savings driven economy, that's the way I would characterize it, I don't know if you agree with that, uh, while the rest of Europe um, in, in terms of France, um, Spain, Italy, Greece and so on, they tend to be more consumption driven and that is a fundamental imbalance which I think has led to this and I just wonder whether any encouragement of savings in the pigs, as it were, um, is possible, whether it might help deal with the situation. I know it's, that's a longer term solution. Do you, do you see it as a savings and consumption imbalance primarily, or um, are there other factors in there? Well, what is for sure is that the euro has um, promoted this, uh, the Overconsumption or the strong consumption in the peripheral countries. No? That interest rates suddenly were reduced because there was uh, suddenly there was the guarantee of Germany behind the debts. So it, it sort of accelerated the difference, isn't, hasn't it? Really, in the yeah, sense. the risk premium yeah. went down and the inflation expectation went down, and then there was credit expense, so there was a huge co consumption boom. Mm. Mm. Well, I think. Uh, If we would reform the euro and get this monetary redistribution away, these incentives to live uh, on others by this redistribution of deficits, then also saving, saving rates would increase in, in these countries. Other, otherwise, there's no incentive really to save, but just to spend and finan increase your debts that yes. others yeah. finance. Exactly. What, um, what is the current mood in Germany like? Because one of the three options that you, or, or possibilities that you saw, is that, that Germany breaks away. Um, is it moving in that direction? Is public opinion tending to move in that direction? Or is public opinion sort of rather confused about the way forward? Well, public opi published public opinion is in favour of the euro and the euro project ever ha has ever been. Um, of course, I guess the big publishing houses and TV channels, uh, they are all in close relationships and financed by big corporations and uh, they, need to, yeah, they need to be in good relationship with the government. So, but this is in stark contrast, I think, through what people on the street thinks, think. Mm? So it's somewhat different at the, on, on the ground? Yes, I, I, and I mean the CDU is losing every election, the FDP is totally disintegrating because, because of this, because the population uh, does, does not agree with supporting peripheral countries uh, and bailing them out. Uh, but there's, no, there's no, no really big player who could announce, uh, pub publish this view uh, in, in the media and no party that is behind this mood. And I don't think that one of the established parties will, will go in this direction, so the only possibility for this to go forward is a new party, a German Tea Party maybe. But, um, and this yes. might go along if inflation starts to rise. There might be a possibility for this, but no, right, not, not now, not yet. So inflation may well hold, hold, hold the key to, to that 
uh, opinion, the, the opinion on the street, beginning to be reflected in, in German politics. Now, that's an interesting point. Um, can I just broaden out the conversation a bit? Because we, we, all currencies are really on a dollar standard as such. And um, if um, uh, the dollar is in trouble, then actually what the ECB is doing is a bit of a sideshow in a sense. Because one way or the other, um, they will always want the euro to be competitive. So if the dollar goes down, the euro will be managed down with it. So the race to the bottom, I think, uh, it's been described as. How do you see the outlook for the dollar, um, given that uh, there has been massive monetary expansion, and given that interest rates are suppressed at well below the rate of inflation, whatever that may be? How do you see the, the dollar developing over the next year or so? Yeah, will probably continue to f fall in value. I mean, they they have expanded yeah, the dollar to the dollar supply to finance the deficits, uh, um, and I don't see that government deficits in in the U.S. will will fall, especially before the election. They will probably uh, still increase, and they are so huge the deficits that drastic measures would be necessary, uh, and and. Well, only if deficits are really reduced, then the dollar could gain gain uh, gain in value. But uh, I don't see that coming. One thing that the um, Federal Reserve Board has stated is that they intend to keep interest rates down at current levels until the middle of 2013. Do you see that as a possibility, given that uh, inflation is running at, well, I think according to the CPI, something around about 4%, if you look at uh, John Williams' shadow stats, he's talking about 10%. Um, with inflation so much above the level of interest, we're coming into the winter when there's going to be greater demand for energy and therefore oil prices are likely to come under upward pressure just purely from the demand side rather than the extra production of money side, as it were. Do you see them being able to keep interest rates down throughout 2012 against this background? It's hard to say. Are you talking about official inflation rates or, or well, what really is happening on the, on the street? Because here what they measure like 3% inflation in Europe, this is not what I am experiencing, for example. One difference between the Fed and the ECB is, which makes me uh, less bullish on the dollar, is that we have there, in, on the direction of the Fed, we have uh, Ben Bernanke, who will do anything to prevent uh, prices from falling. And we we're just printing money. He thinks any problem can be solved by printing money, and I think the leadership of the ECB is not so so crazy in this regard. They are more pragmatic. They they want to save the euro project, but at the same time they know they cannot uh, be too drastic because otherwise there will be uh, Germany will lose the euros. So in this regard, I th I think the euro is uh, better. Than, uh, might be better than, than, than the dollar because it always counts who's really running the thing and the ideas that they have. And if you look what Bernanke has published academically, he's, <laughs> he's actually doing what, what he's preaching, I mean, what, what, what he wrote. He thinks, he really thinks he's convinced that he can solve anything by printing money. Uh, Philip, we've spent a lot of time talking about unsound money. Um, if we can just think about sound money now. Um, is there a way in which we can go from unsound money into sound money? Sound, by sound money, I really mean gold, which governments cannot print. Well, there, there are several ways. Uh, one would be for the government to just take all the gold that are in the central banks and back all money titles with it 100%. It'd just be an adjustment of price, in effect, to a level where it is backed 100%. Yes, yes. Uh, it, make, it would make obvious all the wealth destruction that has occurred before. Um, this would be one way, and then the government could get out of, of money. Uh, the se second way would be just uh, don't, we, won't, we don't want to impose something like gold. We just take away all government interventions like close the central bank, abolish legal tender laws, and look what will, would evolve on the market. And probably very fast gold would, because of its characteristic, be money again. However, these possibilities both imply that the government does the reform 
And as you said, it's not in the interest of the government to do that because they cannot print gold and they, they want more power, they want to spend, they want to buy votes and therefore um, taxes are very unpopular but producing money and finance this is a much uh, more elegant way for them to get away with it. So, uh, the banking system of course would not be in favor of that because uh, their possibility to produce money out of thin air would uh, go away. So the big elite of, of, of the countries would be against it. So, so the last option, sad option in some sense also would be that it would be a reaction against the government. That people start using commodities or more, more gold privately even though the government uh, does, not, does not allow or even forbids it. Um, because their inflation starts to rise ever more. This would be a sign of a total total collapse and uh, more and more chaos. But this might be also more a long-run uh, possibility that uh, against the government people start using sound money. It would be the crack-up boom as uh, I think von Mises described it. Yes. Philip, thank you very much indeed for taking the time to uh, speak to me and was, uh, I found that extremely interesting and I hope um, lots of people read your excellent book which uh, I certainly found very, very interesting. Thank you. You're very welcome. I thank you. Subscribe to the Gold Money newsletter at www.goldmoney.com to receive email updates on new articles, videos and iTunes podcasts from our Gold Research section. Which um, I think very briefly, if I can describe it correctly, is when everybody uses a common facility without regard for its future. And you've interestingly used this as a description as to what some of the countries within the Euro region have been doing since they joined. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes. Um, the tragedy of the commons occurs when property rights are not defined well. Uh, an example would be fishes in the ocean. No one is the owner, so everyone can... can Hello, I'm Alistair MacLeod and I'm here in Madrid on behalf of the Gold Money Foundation and with me is Philip Bagus, who is the author of this interesting book, The Tragedy of the Euro, a very topical subject, Philip. Um, I was particularly interested in, uh, you were using the analogy of the tragedy of the common fish, so the incentive is to fish as fast as you can because otherwise the other fish will, will fish and have some profits. While stocks last. <laughs> yeah, yes. so, so it leads to over-exploitation. And the same happens with the, with the euro. What is exploited there is the purchasing power of the euro because in a complex way any government can basically print, print euros. Well, I, let me explain this. What governments can do, they cannot print euros, but they can print paper and they write on it government bonds. Not one government can do that that is finance the expenditures um, through monetization, uh, through the banking system, but any government can do that. So the incentive is to, do, uh, to externalize the costs of your deficits on the users of the currency, but in this case the users of the currency are not only your citizens, but also the citizens in the rest of the Eurozone. And there's one more point. Um, in analogy to the fishing example, let's exam uh, let's imagine. then they sell it to the banking system and the banking system gives it to the ECB as collateral for new loans and the banks receive new reserves and on top of these reserves they can expand the money supply, credit expansion. So this is the way that uh, traditionally um, government deficits are indirectly monetized. The same happens with the Fed. The only difference is that the Fed buys directly the government bonds. It doesn't take it as collateral for new loans. But at the end it's the same. Where well, the thing in the Eurozone is that